chapter 3, you know, as we've been going through Habakkuk, the Chaldeans send Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonians, however you want to call it, that he was going to use them to bring correction to his people. You know, Habakkuk's prayer there, his, his, his intercession or his questioning to God or his, his uh, uh, speaking with the Lord, Habakkuk would go to the Lord and he'd say, God, why? You know, why are you using a wicked nation to judge your people, a Gentile nation, if you will, to judge your people? And, you know, the Lord there in chapter 2 responded to Habakkuk, and, you know, he basically told him that I'm in control. You know, that, yeah, I'm going to, there's going to be judgment, there's going to be trial, there's going to be tribulation, there's going to be hard times and correction, however you want, teaching. You know, as we went through Hebrews there, it talked about the chastening of the Lord. That's the teaching. That's the Lord bringing things our way. Sometimes it's, it's, it's correction because we've gone the wrong way. With Israel of that day, it was correction. God loves us so much that he will correct our wrong direction. He, and, and oftentimes to do that, you know, people, a lot of times as we uh, minister on the message of the cross and and we talk, and you know, the message of the cross being the gospel, and the fact that the gospel is what Christ has done for us at Calvary. It's the good news. And as we understand the gospel or the message of the cross, we understand that we are uh, crucified with Christ, that we're buried with Christ. We understand that we're risen with Christ, and we also understand that having given our hearts and our lives to Christ, and and by faith that the, the uh, sin nature is to not, to not be ruling and reigning in our hearts and in our lives, and that if for whatever reason our faith deviates from Christ and what he did for us on the cross, then we revert, if you will, back to a position of even trying to live for the Lord, we revert back to a position of trying to live for God by the means of rules and regulations, by the means of our own strength and our own ability. And when we err in that direction, even unknowingly, we, we go astray. It's the same as what Israel did whenever they went astray, worshiping Baal or taking on the things of the world around them. The church today, we have we've brought in the things of the world around us just as Israel did. It's no that we have erred, and when we err, you know, people. I'm going back to the uh, the the uh, uh, sin nature. You know, a lot of some people will say, "Oh, well, we don't have a sin nature after we come to Christ," and that's not so. You know, because we that that sin nature is still there, but he is not that sin nature is not to rule. It is not to reign supreme. We're not to serve that any longer. But when our faith is misplaced, then that sin nature revives. It comes back. It, 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 it seats itself upon the throne, begins to rule and reign again. And, and a lot of people don't understand that the Lord allows that to still be there as a means of correction to us. Because anything outside of Christ and Him crucified, or faith in Christ and Him crucified, any faith in anything else will lead to the sin nature being revived and we once again going into bondage. And that's what I'm talking about here. The children of Israel in Habakkuk's day, you know, the Lord would use, and this is the picture, if you will, of it, it's an Old Testament type of a New Testament uh, reality, if you will, that the Lord would use the the. Gentile heathen nations around Israel, them being a type, if you will, of the sin nature, he would use them to bring correction to his people when they erred. I mean, hopefully I, I, I explain that in a way that we can understand and we can know. And oftentimes, just as Habakkuk, we don't realize it. We don't realize that it's that sin nature bringing us once again back into bondage and captivity because we have erred. Yes. And that's basically kind of what the Lord had revealed to Habakkuk. He had shown him and told him, you know, 
that, that he is in control. That's basically what the end of, of chapter 2 was. And the end of the Lord's reply to Habakkuk is that he, the Lord, was still in control. He's still seated on his throne. And that's what we need to understand, that God is still seated on his throne, no matter the trials and the tribulations. And not every trial, not every tribulation you go through, understand this, I'm not saying that if you're going through hard times, if you're suffering different things in your life, that it's because of sin in your life. Sometimes it's just because of where we live, folks. We live in a fallen world. We live in a world system that has as its ruler the, prin the, 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 the principalities and powers of darkness. The enemy himself is the, the ruler of the world system, but God is still the ruler of he is still in control of all of that. The enemy, as, we see, as we've seen in Job, the enemy still has to have the permission of the Lord. Sometimes the Lord gives him leeway. So every, every where, I, where, I, where I'll go there is everything you go through is not necessarily because you sinned. And sometimes it's not even necessarily because the devil's messing with you. It rains on the just and the unjust all alike is what the word tells us. Things happen. Go ahead. Yes. Okay. Well, that's absolutely right. He is right, but he's also just. Yes, he is. You know, and, and we got to be careful that God, in His love, you know, we got to understand that correction is part of love. Yes. Yes. What father that loves his children doesn't correct his children? You see, we we've got the idea that love is all accepting of every. No, it's not. That is totally wrong. That is the world's misconception of love and the love of God. You know, I see, I saw the other day a billboard. All we need is love. Yeah. No, they don't understand love because the world's type of love says that, oh, you should let me do whatever I want. If you love me, you see, that's the same concept. You ever, growing up, you know, maybe your mama would tell you, especially you ladies, you girls, you know, she would say, just because that boy tells you he loves you, if you love me, you'll do this. That's not love, folks. You know, maybe your mama told you that, or maybe she should have told you that or something, but didn't. But just because somebody says, I love you, you should let me have my way with you, that's not love. Because love, true love, is a sacrificial love. True love says, I will deny myself. I will lay down. See, that's the love that Christ had, that though he had, he was supreme. He had all of heaven. He had the glory of heaven. He laid that aside, and he, he came and died on the cross for us. Now, that is love, and that is the example of love that we need to understand. Love, true love, real love will sacrifice it. See, it will stand in front of the bullet for you. See, that's if you will, that's what Jesus did. He, he stood in front of the bullet. For, he went to Calvary on our behalf. He did not for anything. He gained, he got the raw, he got the raw end of the stick. He got the, the, the bad deal off of it. I mean, he died for us, and we're a bunch of ungrateful, rotten, you know, crumb bags, if you will. But the Lord loved us so much that he was willing to do that even from before the foundation of the world, as we've talked about. Before anything, he ever created anything, his love determined that Christ would go to Calvary. Therefore, because of that, he could create everything, mankind and everything else that we see today. Because of his love. See, his love was just... So, the misconception that love, let, love lets you do whatever you want is wrong. Love corrects. Love says, hey, you're going the wrong way. Love says, turn around. You know, and that's what, what's going on. But with Habakkuk here, God was reminding Habakkuk, I'm still in control. Yeah, there's going to be chastisement. There's going to be correction. It's going to be done this way. And see, there's another thing. we got to trust the Lord that whenever there is that chastisement and correction, the way he does it is the best way. Right. You know, we got to realize you know, you think about it, man, you know, what did uh, uh, it said there in Hebrews that, you know, the father does it after his, or, or the earthly father 
corrects us and, 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 and chastises or punishes after his own pleasure. You see, if we, if man is allowed to do it, or if man does it, it's not always right. And there, were, there was something there I wanted to read. I put it in notes. I'm going to see if I could find it real quick that I forgot to read last week. Um, hopefully I can find it here in just a minute. This, I think this might be it right here. But from, from a commentary that I was reading, it says, In answer to Habakkuk's prayer of why evil is allowed to continue, God shows him that judgment is coming and that he as well as we should remain trusting in him that he will judge the wicked. This is the thing I wanted to pull out. God has given liberty of action to man. Therefore, man is a responsible being. Man is a responsible being. Those who abuse that liberty, God will judge regardless of who they are, believer or non-believer. So, though God, even though God would use that wicked nation of Babylon to judge his people, he still gave Nebuchadnezzar, if you will, he still gave them the ability to temper, if you will, or not, what they would do to those people. And unfortunately, they went too far. But God, it, it, because they went too far, God destroyed Babylon. And see, that's a lot of what he talks about here in Habakkuk there in that second, that God is going to judge Babylon, though God gave them the the charge, if you will. He gave them that. He, he put them in the place to be used as a form of chastisement to his people. Still, he allowed them. You know, God had go this far, but he didn't stop them if they chose to go further. They went further, and God judged them for that. Yeah. You know, so that's. That's kind of what we got to understand. God, even in the instruments that he uses, he will give them the freedom of choice. He will give them the liberty, you know, to go so far. But if they go farther, if we go farther, however you want to look at that, there will be a recompense to pay. Hopefully, hopefully we understand that. So anyway, Habakkuk chapter 3 is really a psalm. It is actually a song that Habakkuk, being that, you know, we see in there where, like in verse 3, there's that Salah in there. That is uh, common in the Psalms. But this is a song that Habakkuk would, if you will, I guess you could say he would compose it. He would, he would draw it through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And it was a psalm of comfort to God's people, you know, knowing that God is still in control, even knowing they're going into captivity or maybe had already gone into captivity, maybe this was brought out and, and maybe Habakkuk uh, uh, was given this even after the captivity had, had, you know, taken place. It is still, it's a psalm of comfort and, or a song of comfort. And, you know, I like what Brother Lonnie brought out, you know, and I've said it before too. You know, he, he said Sunday that, you know, we need to be reading the Psalms. And he had been reading the Psalms and the comfort that it brought to him and the, the peace that it brings to us. You see, that's what this is here in Habakkuk. It is a song. You know, just think about the songs that we sing. Okay, let's. There are some songs that go under the guise of maybe contemporary Christian, and they're all about, they're nothing but psychological bluff, fluff. It's all about, uh, you know, that station that says positive and encouraging. It's all about psychology and self. You know, but a true song like this is in Habakkuk, like we're going to see here and like we see in the Psalms over and over again, we find comfort and encouragement as we exalt the Lord. So if you're listening to music that is not exalting Jesus Christ, that is it not praising him, thanking him, giving him the glory and the praise, you're not going to find any real strength. You're not going to find any real peace, not any lasting strength or lasting peace from 
anything else, no matter though it goes under the guise of Christian music or not. Just keep that in mind. I mean, that's why we, we, we like the hymn book so much, because in the hymn book, there is doctrine in those hymns. There is extolling. Some of the hymns aren't good, but some of the hymns are good. We try to, you know, pick out the ones. Just like I said, some of that other music, some's good, some's not. That 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 he is, that that is anointed of the Holy Spirit, and this goes for music anywhere. There's a lot of music that will pull at your heartstrings. There's a lot of music that will bring up emotion in you, get you worked up, if you will. There's a lot of preachers that will get you worked up. They know how to work up a crowd. You know, that's a skill, if you will, that they've developed or something just by things that they do. And really, it's a hypnotism, you know. Who has bewitched you is what Paul would ask the Galatians. But see, those things will do that in our lives. It will bewitch us. It will hypnotize us. And before we know it, we find ourselves kind of floating along with the flow or whatever, you know, some words that they like to use there. But true worship, true Holy Spirit anointed worship or praise will always be directed to Christ. It will always be looking to, look what the Lord has done. He healed my body. He touched my mind. You know that song that we sing sometimes. You know, look what the Lord has done. He has paid the price on Calvary's cross. And that's what we see here in this third chapter of Habakkuk as we get going. I know he, he calls it a prayer, but think about this too, that it is not wrong to pray in song. You know, a lot of times prayer, a lot of times something, things we sing here, we'll, we'll say, you know, maybe the close of service, make this your prayer this week. And it'll be a song that the ladies are singing or something. You know, so this, this prayer of Habakkuk, this closing prayer of the book of Habakkuk is a psalm. It's a song. However they put it to me, don't ask me how, don't ask, I mean, we think of songs as they have to rhyme and, you know, flow and stuff. When you read this, it may not rhyme, but I don't know how they sung it. I don't know how they did things back then. I don't know how they do things even now, you know, with music. But that's what this is. And a lot of times, you know, Susie will come up with, you know, we'll, ha we'll have songs on a Sunday morning that are verses of Scripture. We'll be singing the Scripture in praise to the Lord, and that's what's anointed by the Holy Spirit. <coughs> Yes, sir. Nope. Just doing something. Oh. There you go. So, like Brother Lonnie was saying, um, you get into Psalms. Now, in Ephesians 5.18, it says, Be not drunk with wine, mm -hmm. wherein, is, where, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves. Psalms, hymns, and Psalms, and, and hymns, songs. and spiritual songs. So can we directly say that that's how we get filled with the Spirit? By the no, Psalms? We get filled with the Spirit by faith. Yeah, by faith. Yes. Obviously. Everything we receive from the okay. Lord comes by faith. But as we are filled by the Spirit, those songs will flow out from us, from your innermost being. Yeah. And stuff, those songs and hymns and spiritual songs and will, will flow out from us even yeah. more freely. You know, And sometimes they'll yeah. be singing what, what, we, what we understand, singing in the Spirit with that prayer yeah. language. You know, yep. just as we receive that prayer language when we are when we, we are baptized in the Holy Spirit, we have a prayer language. We can sing in the Spirit, mm -hmm. if you will, in that prayer language oftentimes. But even those who aren't necessarily baptized in the Holy Spirit, they can still sing in psalms and hymns and spiritual song, making melody in your heart unto the Lord. I don't think you could do that without faith either way. No, you know, without faith, it's impossible I mean, to please him. There's no way you can make melody to the Lord in your exactly, heart. Exactly, without with believing, yeah. without trusting. That's, exactly. You bring that out, and that's really yeah. Habakkuk. You know, faith yeah. is the foundation. Everything comes by faith. By faith in what? By faith in who Jesus is. You know, Habakkuk's prayer was, was, was or his, his song here, prayer of song, whatever you want to call it, it was all... Uh, orchestrated if you what was all it all came from that faith that trust in the lord that the god of the earth will do right or that you know the lord will do right he the judge of all the earth will do right i think is what scripture says but anyway habakkuk chapter 3 and verse 1 
It says, a prayer of Habakkuk the prophet upon Shiganoth. And that Shiganoth there, it's a musical term, and it also it means to err. Uh, to err would be the meaning of the word. And it says, Habakkuk uses this to teach his countrymen to confess not only their more grievous sins, but also their errors and negligences, negligence, negligences into which they were especially likely to fall when in exile away from the Holy Land. You know, so this was a, a song that God had given to him because, you know, first of all, we got to realize that we have it. You know, until you realize that you have sinned, you're not going to repent of sin. Oftentimes the preaching has to go forth. And, and why don't we see repentance in the church anymore or much more today? Because nobody is preaching what sin is. Sin is missing the mark. Sin is going in the wrong direction. Sin is going against what God has said and established in His Word. Sin would be taking old oil and putting it in your new truck that would be sinning towards your truck because you didn't put the new oil in there. It's going to cause it to break down. It's not what the manual says. You see, when we sin, when we err, we go against what the manual, the Word of God, God Almighty, the maker of you and I, the one who formed man from the dust, he knows what's best for man. We sin whenever we don't fulfill that which God has. We sin ultimately the crowning sin of all sin is faith in something other than our Lord and Savior, in what who God is and what He's done. Just like if you took your, your, your car manual and you chunked it in the trash and you tried to work on your car or, or uh, 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 maintain your brand new car off of a bicycle instruction book or maintenance book, things aren't going to mesh up. They're not going to work right because it's not the same the bicycle is not the same as your car. It doesn't have the same components and it doesn't need the same maintenance as your car does. You, by going to another source, whatever that source may be, whatever how good that source may look, it's not the source that created you. It is not the source who, who knows intricately, intricately your design, You know how he made you. You're fearfully and wonderfully made, the word tells us. You know, God has a pattern. He has a way that we are to be kept. He has a way that we are to be, if you will, maintained. And that way is by faith. And we go outside of that, you know, faith in Him, in His Word, in who He is and what He has done. When we go outside of that, we're using another book, another, another manual to orchestrate, to walk by, to, to, to have our lives led by. We got to walk by the word of God with man because he made us. He is the one who knows us. We need to trust him. You know, you don't take the Ford manual and try to fix the Chevy. You trust the Ford guy because he made the truck or whatever. You see, I'm just using those as, as examples. We don't take the manual for something else or make up one. That's what man's good at. We've made up all kinds of manuals on how man's to live. And we've forsaken the manual, if you will, the word of God on how we are to live. So that's the airing, and that's what Habakkuk is talking about here. It's a, this is a song, and this is a prayer, you know, recognizing and that, that, that the Lord would give to Habakkuk to give to his people that first we must recognize that, oh, Lord, I have sinned. Right. Amen. Lord, I have missed the mark. Lord, I have gone in the wrong direction. And the thing that we have to realize is whenever we do acknowledge that, then we don't just keep going in that direction. And we've talked about that. You know, we turn around. We repent. Repentance is a good thing. Repentance is not bad. Repentance should never be looked at as a shameful thing. It should not be shameful to repent. Repentance is a glorious thing. The sin brings the shame. The repentance should bring peace you see and, and and as we do that you know we, we talked about i think it was easter sunday being a new creature in christ jesus there's going to be a change in our hearts and in our lives as we look to jesus christ because as we look to him through the law of the spirit of life the holy spirit works in us and on us 
to bring us into the image of Christ, to conform us into the image of Jesus Christ. You see, and that, that, that image, once again, ultimately is an image of trusting the Father, taking Him at His word, laying down, dying to self, being conformed to His death, dying to everything we want, and placing our faith in God totally and completely for everything and trusting Him, no matter the situation, no matter what we're going through. So we've got to recognize our sin. We've got to recognize that we have erred, and that's what he's talking about there. And in verse 2, he says, O Lord, I have heard thy speech. I have heard the word that you have given. Have we heard? You see, it's by hearing. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Amen? So we've got to hear that word. Why don't we see, like we said, repentance? It's not preached. The word's not being preached. Right. When God's word is preached, sin is confronted. Amen? Amen. You see, we don't see that. that there's, there's churches full of people that they're just, oh, I'm going to float along. I'm going to get all this by osmosis. But they've never repented of their sin. They just continue. Maybe they've refine themselves. Maybe they're living a little better life, but they've never repented of their sin. That, that is apostate, yes. And those that preach it are apostates. Well, to be apostate, wait a minute, maybe they're not apostate because maybe they never even came to the knowledge of the truth. <coughs> to be apostate, you have to have known the truth and then oh, fell on away from it. So, you know, they're... they're yeah, something like that. We don't. I, we, you can't. We can't judge the heart of another. I don't know if they ever accepted him, but for the majority, if they didn't repent, if they didn't turn around, if they just cleaned things up and kept on going, well, I'm not as bad as I used to be. You know, are, are you still are you trusting Christ? Have you trusted Him? Have you put your faith? Have you said, Lord, I can't do it? You see, religion. We got a lot of religion in the church today. Religion will say, oh, I'll clean up my act. I'll come to God when I clean up my act. It's not going to happen because you can't clean up your act. If you could, Jesus died in vain. If you could, then we don't need the help of the Holy Spirit. See, Jesus died that sin might be paid, that the sin debt might be paid for, that we might be washed and cleansed and changed and what? Born again. You had to be, you have to be born again. For the Holy Spirit to enter in. And I'm not talking about the baptism in the Holy Spirit. I'm talking about that spirit of regeneration. You have to repent and be born again for that spirit of regeneration, for the Holy Spirit to be able to come in and take up residence, and for the law of the Spirit to become in a, or to come into effect in our lives. And only as the law of the whole of the Spirit is in effect in our lives will our lives be being changed by the Holy Spirit. If the Holy Spirit's not doing the changing, then there's no salvation because you're not going to be able to do it in and of yourself. It takes the power of the Spirit to change that wretched man that I am. And he only works within the parameters of faith in Christ and Him crucified. No other... Why have we say that? We, God don't need another way. God came up with that way. That's the way the manual has it. You, you don't drain the oil out of the truck by unplugging the differential. You're going to get the, di the different oil. Amen. You're not going to change the engine oil by going to the rear of it and taking the plug out of the differential. The Holy Spirit is the one. That's how you're not going to do it any other way except by the way God has established in His Word through the law of the Spirit. So He says, O Lord, I have heard Thy speech. I have heard Thy Word and was afraid. You see, when we hear the Word of the Lord, it brings a reverential fear, or it should bring a reverential fear into our hearts. And why do you think this world is so adamant on pushing out the word of God. They pushed it out of the church, out of the, the schools in the 60s here in this nation. They pushed it. Why do you think these communist nations, they hate the word of God? Really in any form. I mean, if it has any, even some of these uh, off
off the wall kind of, if you will, translations, if even they have just a little semblance of the truth of the Word of God in them, the devil hates it. These communist nations and these other, and even in here in America sometimes, they want to push it out because even with just a little bit of the hearing of the Word of God, there comes, there might come to this. Somebody just might get saved. You know, even with just a little bit, you know, with with a lot of the Word of God, there's a lot of freedom. With little of the Word of God, there's little freedom. So he says, I have heard thy word, and I was afraid it brings the fear of the Lord. And it should. As we understand and we see what is in his word, it should make us tremble. Because we, whenever we realize how far we've missed the mark, how far off of the direction of the manual we've gotten, there, there should be a fear and trembling. You know, just like with your vehicle, and I keep using that as an example, sooner or later, the further you get off from the maintenance of it, it's going to start to shimmy and shake. It's going to fall apart. You know, our lives fall apart without the Word of God and without His abiding presence and us adhering to that word. God made you. He knows what's best for you. So I've heard your word, and I was afraid. He says, O Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the year. Once, once again, he, the, the prophet is asking for the Lord to once again do that work that he had done before. And he's fixing to enumerate and go through all that the Lord had done. And the lesson there for us today is, oh, Lord, is you, I know you have done this for me in the past. I know you have done this for your people in the past. Oh, Lord, do again that which you have done. Lord, you saved me. You healed me. You filled me. Whatever it was, Lord, I'm asking you to do it again. Though I have erred, Lord, I'm coming back. Lord, once again, move in my heart and in my life. Lord, I want that, 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 that feeling, however it was, you know. Lord, what you did before in my heart and in my life. Lord, do it again. Make your word alive to me. Once again, Lord. Is, that's what he's saying. Revive thy work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make known. Make it known again to me, O Lord. He says, in wrath, remember, though there's going to be, he acknowledges that there is, is a, uh, there's, there's consequences to actions. But he's saying, Lord, in your wrath, remember your mercy. Amen. Remember that, the mercy that you have had on us before. Verse 3, he says, God came from Taman and the Holy One from Mount Param. And that Taman there, that, that, uh, that, that, that speaks from old times, from ancient times. Lord, you are from ancient. Lord, you are everlasting. From before the foundation of the world, Lord. And he says, and from Mount Paran. Mount Paran was there in the same area, the same mountain range as Sinai. So what he's doing is saying, as you spoke to us, as you came to us there on Sinai, Lord, come once again. Amen. He's saying from from old from the time from Abraham's day from even before then Lord you were there he said he came from Taman and the Holy One from Mount Paran and then there's that Salah which you know some say that means amen but it, it's also a musical term and I don't know all the nuances with it as I was reading some commentary it brought it out but I don't remember it it says his glory covered the heavens and the earth was full of his praise you know, at that time, you know, the glory of the Lord came down upon the mountain, came down in the form of a cloud. You know, God spoke to Moses at that time. His glory covered the heavens, and the earth was full of his praise. His brightness was as the light. The Lord was shown so brightly. He, he outshone the sun, you know, as Jesus on that Mount of Transfiguration Whenever he met with, I think they said it was Moses and Elijah there, and the disciples saw he, he shone with glory. When Moses, even when he came down from the mountain from meeting with God there and receiving the Ten Commandments, he had to put a veil over his face because he shone with that glory of God reflect, was still residing, if you will, on him to the point that the people couldn't even look at Moses. They said, oh, cover your face. The glory of God is too great on you. 
You know, so that's his brightness was as the light. He had horns coming out of his hand, and there was the hiding of his power. You know, those horns, horns represent power and strength. As I was reading about this, it talks about, you know, lightning and thunderings, you know, was coming out of his hands. Just from his hand alone, it speaks of the power of Almighty God, the power of God in the lives of his people. You see, he, he, he is remembering, he's, he's bringing this as a song to the people, even in captivity. And, and this was a song to sing. This is a song, if you will. This is something for you and I today to remember. The glory and the majesty and the power of Almighty God. Even though we may be going through some troubles and some trials and some tribulations. Even though God may not be answering us as we would like Him to answer. We still need to remember that God is all-powerful. God is almighty. That's your God. Even in our world today, as we see foolishness after foolishness going on and sin running crazy through the land, we need to understand that God is still on the throne. He is mighty to save. He has the power in His hand to put a stop to it when He chooses. And God has a day, He has an hour. He's going to say, Enough is enough, we're done. That we can rest in, folks, if we're trusting Him. The world is going to shake. It's going to tremble. But we don't have to fear because we know our God is able to save. He did it before. That's what He's fixing to go through here. Before Him went the pestilence. And burning coals went forth at his feet. That means from him proceeded all things. He stood and measured the earth. Mm. As I was reading commentary, it said he stood and he looked over the earth. The God of all the earth. The judge of all the earth. He knows what's going on. There's nothing. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Not even the hair that falls from your head goes unnoticed by God. Hmm. Boy. That should, give, that should give you pause. Lord, I'm worried about this thing. You know what's going on in my life. You know every hair that falls from my head. You know every bird. You know every flower, every blade of grass, Lord. You know it all. You have it all in control. God, I'm just trusting you. Lord, help me to trust you more. But even in captivity, we can call out to him. We can sing these songs. How many times when you're going through a trial, God will give you a song. He'll give you a song to sing. And you can rejoice in that. He says, he stood and measured the earth. He beheld and drove asunder the nations. <laughs> Who's in control of these things? Russia ain't controlling nothing. America ain't controlling nothing. What's going on over there in Israel? God's got it all under control. We were talking about Iran. They want to, we're going to get you. You ain't going to do nothing that God don't let happen. God's drawing you in because you're a sucker. He's drawing you into that area where he's going to finally destroy. He's going he's gonna to take you down and take you out. Israel will prevail. It's going to look like they're going to be totally on the verge of being wiped out. The Antichrist is going to think, I got this. God's word has failed. And Jesus is going to intervene right then. God is going. He, he has the last word. His glory, his power shall be shown throughout the earth. He stood and measured the earth. He beheld and drove asunder the nations. And the everlasting mountains were scattered. You hear that? The mountains will even, those mountains that you think, oh, they've been there forever and forever and forever. <laughs> They'll be here when we're gone. Uh -uh. God's going to level it all. The mountains were scattered. The perpetual hills did bow. His ways are everlasting. Mm. His ways are everlasting. I saw the tents of Cushion in affliction. And the curtains of the land of Midian did tremble. What's my note say there? 
It's, all, it's a recounting of the mighty works of God's in the life of his people. You see, a lot of what we're going to read through here, if we think about it, is how God moved for his people, either in the wilderness as they came across the Red Sea and the deliverance from Egypt, Egyptian bondage as they crossed the River Jordan, as they went and conquered the land. He, he is recounting. He is reminding. Ooh, how many times have we talked about that? We need some reminding a lot of times. Reminding to keep our faith in Christ. Reminding to put our trust in the Lord. Sometimes it gets to where we're like a broken record, but we need reminding because in our affliction, in our times of trouble, we tend to see the sea around us and the storm around us rather than looking to Jesus. As long as we look to Jesus, we'll walk on that water. We'll walk above that storm. We'll be more than victorious, more than conquerors in Christ Jesus as we look to him and we get our it's when we get our eyes off of him, off of the Lord and what he has already done that we begin to sink in despair. We begin to sink in, in the things around us, in depression or whatever it might be. I saw the tents of Cushion in affliction, and the curtains of the land of Midian did tremble. Was the Lord displeased against the rivers? Was thine anger against the rivers? Was thy wrath against the sea, that thou didst ride upon thine horses and thy chariots of salvation? He's asking there, you know, when God parted the Red Sea, whenever he parted the River Jordan, he said, was God mad at those things that he did that? No, God did that to show his power, to show his salvation to his people, to save his people, to lead his people out. That was the salvation. God wasn't angry with the water, but God was using those things to show his power, to show his salvation to his people and to the nations around them. What was it whenever they went into Jericho that Rahab would say to the children, we know what God has done for you, and it makes us afraid. You see, some were afraid, but some like Rahab. She said, hey, I want that God. I want to trust in that God. Because that God moves for his people. These dumb idols, they don't do nothing. They can't even talk. They can't even get up. They don't even open their eyes. These are dumb idols. But I want that God that moves. See, we need to have that in our hearts and in our We need to be remembering. We need to be rehearsing. We need to be telling what the Lord has done in our hearts and in our lives. That people might say, I want that God. I want that salvation. You see, that's that witness that we've talked about whenever... You go tell somebody what God has done for you. They can't say, oh, no, he didn't. Because you can say, oh, yes, he did because I was there. Mm, I was there when he did it for me. Amen. He brought me through the river. He brought me through the fire. He brought me through the flood. Amen. Mm, he provided for me a table in the wilderness. He made a way when there didn't seem to be a way. I know what God has done for me. And I know because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He'll do it for you if you'll trust him. He says, was the Lord displeased against the rivers? Was thine anger against the rivers? Was thy wrath against the sea? That, that thou didst ride upon thine horses and thy chariots of salvation? Thy bow was made quite naked. They were talk, uh, the, the, the commentary I was reading was talking about taking the bow out of its case and getting ready to fire. God's salvation is like that bow. He's getting ready. He's getting ready. The, thy bow was made quite naked. According to the oaths of the tribes, even thy word, Salah, thou dost cleave the, cleave the earth with rivers. The mountains saw thee, and they trembled. Ooh. The overflowing of the water passed by. The deep uttered his voice and lifted up his hands on high. The sun and moon stood still in their habitation. Remember that one with Joshua? At the light of thine arrows they went out, and at the shining of thy glittering spear. That speaks of that bow shooting forth those arrows. He said, Thou dost march through the land in indignation. Thou dost stretch the heathen in anger. Thou went forth for the salvation of thy people. You went forth. God just saved us. As you saved us in the past, 
Lord, you're going to save us in the future. What you did for us then, God, you're going to do for us today. Amen. That's, it's a, it's a, this should give you some encouragement today. And, and as you read it, this is another psalm you can go read and you can draw strength from in your time of need. You went forth for the salvation of thy people, even for salvation with thine anointed. Points right there to Jesus, the anointed Savior. Thou wounded the head out of the house of the wicked by discovering the foundation unto the neck. That speaks of God going all the way down, going all the way to the depths of the foundation and turning it up, breaking it up of the heathen. That talking about the neck talks about the water flowed over to the point of drowning on them. He says, Thou didst strike through with his staves the head of his villages. They came out as a whirlwind to scatter me. Their rejoicing was as to devour the poor secretly. Thou didst walk through the sea with thine horses through the heap of great waters. Though they came out with one thing in mind, God turned it on. What did God do to Egypt? Children of Israel passed through on dry ground. But when Egypt came through, their wheels fell off their chariots. And the water came in and covered them over. That's what he's recounting here. Recount the blessings of God. What does it say? Count your blessings. Name them one by one. Count your blessings and see what God has done. What did he do for you? He saved your soul first and foremost. I've said it before. We say it again. If he's able to save your soul, he's able to do anything. He is able. Mm, he is able. My God is able to carry me through. You did walk through the sea with thine horses, through the heap of great waters. When I heard my belly tremble. My lips quivered at the voice. Rottenness entered into my bone, but I couldn't even stand. Mm, slain in the spirit. And I trembled in myself that I might rest in the day of trouble. When he cometh up unto the people, he will invade them with his troops. Although the fig tree, oh, this is good here. Well, this is a verse that's quoted quite often. Although the fig tree shall not blossom, Neither shall fruit be in the vines. The labor of the olives shall fail, and the field shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls, no matter how bad it gets. <coughs> no matter how bad things look around you. You see, he's using terms here of that day. These were precious things. These were things of prosperity, things of blessing. Though the blessings stop, there seems to be no blessing. You sit there and you wonder, God, where are you? That's basically what he's saying here. God, where are you? He says, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. This is a declaration of faith once again by Habakkuk. Though everything falls down around me, though I lose everything, I will rejoice in the Lord. Paul would say, I've learned to be content. Whether I've got a lot or a little, I've learned to trust in the Lord. He said, yet will I rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. Though you have nothing, you have salvation. If you have salvation, you got everything. All things for life and godliness in Christ Jesus. Mm. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. Not me. The Lord God is my strength. And he will make my feet like hinds feet. He will make me to walk upon my high places to the chief singer on my string. That was the, the final deal of how wow this was to be sung. He will walk. He will make me to walk 
upon my God will establish you. God will set you up. The Psalms say, He is my refuge. He is my strength. He is my strong tower in a time of trouble. I will trust in the Lord. Amen? That's what Habakkuk is telling his people. Though they're going into bondage, or maybe had already, though you're going through the trial, you're going through the tribulation, going through the 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 the, the the terribleness of whatever's happening to you, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. Put your trust in Him. Hold on to God's unchanging hand. He is your salvation in Christ Jesus. That salvation is all-encompassing. All things for life and godliness in Christ Jesus. Amen? Anybody got any comments? Anything you want to add? All right. Father, we thank you this evening. We thank you, Father, for the encouragement of your word. We thank you, Father, that, Lord, you want us to draw nearer to you each and every day. Lord, touch your people this evening. Lord, let this word encourage us. Lord, let this word draw us closer to you. Father, no matter what the trouble, no matter what the trial we're going through, Lord, let us be encouraged through this word, Father, that you are the God of our salvation, that you are our strength and our strong tower. You are our peace and our hope and our joy. Lord, you are all things that we need for life and godliness. And, Father, let us rest in what you provided for us at Calvary. Lord, we thank you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.